graduate of the University of Louisville School of Dentistry, a captain of the United States Army Dental Corps, co-founder of the American College of Integrative Medicine and Dentistry. He was on the board of directors of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain from the year 2000 to 2007. And both men are currently on the IAOMT board of directors. Please join me in welcoming both of these men to the stage. Uh, <clears throat> Test, test, test. Very good. Since I'm not the first speaker, question? Thank you very much. <laughs> Me and my dear friend, we do not have any financial interest of a product in our talk or any companies offering grant monies, well, we'll take some, uh, for continuing <laughs> dental or medical education program. Is that good? That's correct. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleague, Dr. Robert Harris. How about now? There you go. Okay. So, well, thank Janet for that introduction and Rich Fisher for asking us to speak today. And Rich was talking and asked, um, oh, about a year ago, would we do a talk on how we handle craniofacial pain using the various modalities that, that Phil and I have developed over the years with ozone and different homeopathics. And so I said, well, I guess we could if you, and so we were talking about how we would do that. And so most of the people that uh, I deal with uh, dentally when I lectured for the Academy of Craniofacial Pain with Jack Hayden, we'd always start off kind of with, with, with basic stuff. And uh, we'd say, what are the patients that we see come in with? And so these patients will show up, and they're usually in moderate to severe pain. They've got some kind of dysfunction going on. And they all have their story to tell you. I know you guys know this, you know, you're going to sit there for a half an hour and listen to how many people saw them and didn't know what they were doing. How many appliances they've had that didn't work and you want to make them another one that probably won't work. And how many times they've had trigger point injections and TENS therapy and all this and none of that worked and they have no resolution of their symptoms or their dysfunction. And they really want some help from somebody that they think is capable of giving it to them. And they wander into your office and you're the 10th to 15th person to see them. So the problem with most of these patients is you don't know what you don't know. And most dentists uh, are trained as a certain philosophy of how are we going to treat these patients when they come in with a clicking joint or jaw pain or whatever. And so a lot of times what we treat them with and how we treat them is dependent upon the philosophy we were trained in and so what we do is try to make the patient fit what we know how to do and so and a lot of times that isn't it so then what we do is offer them what we consider our standard of care and what was standard of care well you know if you just go by the book and when I graduated from uh, dental school in 71 they didn't even address TMD other than saying, if these people grind their teeth, that's too bad. They're, not, they're, they're unlucky. If they don't, if they don't have clicking joints, they're lucky. And if they do, make them a flat plane splint, forget about it because you can't fix them anyway. So that was a philosophy in 71. So, but education, as Einstein said, is not learning the learning of facts, but actually making your mind think about what these people present with and what's in our toolbox to fix them with. So what is standard of care? Well, for years, you guys all know this, you know, the soft diet, you know, the moist heat, we'll tell them, oh, do this. And then how about muscle relaxants? Well, you get people on muscle relaxants. I had a little four foot 11, five foot nurse come in one day and uh, she said, I really, I really heard you're really good at treating TMD and uh, so I came for you to treat me. I said, okay. So she said, now, before we get started, I want to get my prescription for Valium filled. And I said, well, I haven't even read your history yet. Oh, I know, but you don't understand. I'm going to need this prescription for Valium. And I said, we well, don't understand because I'm not going to write that until I know what's wrong with you. She's, and she's this little bitty squirt. She stands up out of my chair and she grabs my jacket. She lifts me up and she said, you don't understand. I need that Valium. <laughs> and so I said, oh, okay, we have a little problem here. And so... 
but uh, you know, some people they'll get they'll get hooked on these various things, and so then we look at. NSAIDs. I mean, what a nightmare these things have become. This is from the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, all these people are just popping these things 10, 15, 20 at a time a day, you know, trying to get this. And they're just screwing up all of their cyclooxygenase pathways. And so there's some new things out and a lot of stuff that, that, that we address in some of the lectures that we give uh, with the homeopathics that you can give like Tramiel, Zeal, Ingestol, all these really nice remedies that can get the people off of these and not destroy their liver. So we're going to talk about that a little later. Phil's going to give you some other, other information here. But okay, so standard, what would you do with these people? Well, if they're grinding their teeth, is a night guard or bite guard going to hurt them? Uh, the only time the night guard doesn't work well is when they have Orange syndrome and the stylomandibular ligaments calcified. And then any type of mouth guard is going to make that patient worse. So if you put a splint in on them and they get worse, immediately address the stylomandibular ligament. Go online, look up Orange syndrome, and they'll tell you about that. But look at that bottom thing there. I mean, we're going to put, in, we're going to put a, a splint in, and will this work for that? Hey, you got an osteophyte sticking off of here. No, and then somebody says, the big thing in the Academy of Cranial Facial Pain for years was, where's the disc? It doesn't matter where the disc is if they've got something like that. You're not going to fix that with any kind of a splint. I mean, you th you've, got a lot, you've got a lot of problems on your hand with that. So, we look at this. So, when the standard care is unsuccessful, what's next? Well, you know, get Mr. Spock with his track order or Dr. McCoy, you know, coming in doing some tests for you. And... Um, if they're not available, well, we can try some home exercises, get them to send them to physical therapy. So what normally happens in most dental offices is when the splint doesn't work, you're looking for somebody to dump these people off on because you haven't fixed them with what you know how to do. And they must be crazy because we couldn't fix them with a splint. Well, they're usually not crazy. They've just been in pain so long that they've gotten crazy because nobody can fix them. So. Physical therapy will help them a lot of times, chiropractic treatment, TENS units, uh, some of the stuff that you know, we've seen earlier uh, about the way you do different, different types of therapies, laser therapy is good, all these things, you know, home exercise, body work with the physical therapist or osteopathic manipulations, TENS, laser therapies, you know, lasers work well, trigger point injections, and you can you know, shove Botox in their head if you, you want to do that. Um, I'm not a big fan of Botox. And then you get into some surgical intervention. Most of the time when you do surgery on these patients, they're going to get worse. But there are a few times and a few things that surgical procedures and interventions are worthwhile for. And like on the, on the, the right side of the screen there where you see the sclerosis of articular eminence. I had a 17-year-old kid come in and it was so sclerotic, he couldn't get out of the socket. And when he did, he got lo an open lock and you couldn't get him closed. So an oral surgery friend of mine went in, shaved that articular eminence down very carefully, and the kid is still a patient of mine. He's like, well, he's not a kid anymore. He's like 35, 40. He's never had one issue the rest of his life. But those surgeons have to really be good when they do this because I don't know if you all you know, realize if you do much TMD, but you see this laying right up in there, that dark spot in that bone there? That's the brain. Okay, so, you know, you, and that's why the head of the condyle gives way a lot of times and you have all those weird osteophytes and weird breakdown at the head of the condyle because it will sacrifice itself before it will erode the fossa because if it erodes the fossa you get a subdural hematoma and die so it's a survival mechanism and then you get you take things like this assist yes splint isn't going to help assist so you really need good diagnostics to find this stuff up out before you do you know anything like open joint surgery so let's look for a common denominator well, you're not going to find it. There isn't one in craniofacial pain because all these patients are different. And so, in musing one time on one of the Star Trek episodes, Dr. McCoy says, life and death are seldom logical. You know, as, as Mr. Spock would say. And you can't evaluate a man by logic alone. So, how have we treated these patients in the past? And why have some of them gotten better? Simple. In plain non-Vulcan English, we just got lucky on some of these people. And they got better on their own because the body's an amazing thing. If you give it an opportunity to heal, a lot of times it will. And if you take a burden off of it, a lot of times it'll jump up there and heal. So 
What generalized issues then will contribute to the things that we really have difficulty treating? If it's not structural, uh, then it develops this neurogenic type of pain. You'll hear it called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, post-herpetic neuralgia, all these things. We're just trying to hang a name on it so you can put it on the insurance form and get paid for it. So if we're looking at injuries, then, you know, if you're not careful and you crash an enterprise, you know, you're going to have some trauma there. So... Uh, the you know, traumatic injuries is one thing, but then here's some stuff that we do to them. You know, we got an, an old a tooth with endo and you try to put a post in and it splits off. And then they can't figure out why the tooth's hurting until you take an x-ray and then, whoops, uh, we've got a little uh, fracture in the root there. Well, now we'll do a hemosection on it and try to do that and then hang a cantilever bridge off and everything. And after they spend $20,000, still take the tooth out. So, you know, I think yeah, a lot of times you used to get throwing, you know, good money after bad. So you need to bail out. A lot of times I'll see the people come in and they'll have recent lo lots and lots of crowns put in their mouth. And especially, especially the zirconia ones, which are so darn hard and they're really hard to get equilibrated sometimes. So you have to look at that as one of the issues. Now, and this is just stuff that falls right in where we live with all these dental patients. But then we get to the infections. And if you get infections in here, you know, you've, you know, sometimes you look at these teeth, they all do a root canal and that, and even we do ozone, but some of these teeth you just got to let go. And you've got to let the patient know, we can't save every tooth you've got in there. And is it your life or your tooth? Well, you know, and if these patients come in with something like that and they've got some kind of systemic issue, limes or something like that, just got to get, get the infection out as much as fast and as well as possible. And then you've got the systemic infections that we deal with. You know, we've got candida in our mouth all the time, but why would it jump up like that and just attack this poor girl? And so it, she's got this inside her mouth and in every other uh, organ system in her body. It's digestive, it's urogenital. And what makes it jump up like that? Well, a lot of people say her immune system is all knocked down because she's got Lyme's disease. And Lyme disease is transmitted by ticks, but not always, because it's a spirochete. So it can be trans there can be other vectors for it other than, than a tick. So what other things are we looking at immunologically? Well, as I don't have to tell anybody here, you know, a mercury, okay? And mercury and BPA, you know, and all these things that attack our immune system and we need to try to find these and get these out and adequately get these people into the hands of an MD who can chelate them or give them certain things so they can get these these real bad immunological challenges out of their system so and then some people come in with uh, like staph or strep infections had a little girl that was uh, three years old that went to a swimming pool and got this and this isn't this is not her but and we, we tried to, they tried to treat her for about four or five months with everything. And finally, the one thing that got it was ozonated olive oil. I mean, that was pretty simple. But, you know, nobody thought of that because they didn't know what they didn't know. And so when we look at these patients, they all fall into this one category of uniqueness. Okay? And so if we're going to treat these unique patients, we need to develop a unique treatment model for every patient that we have. And when we look at these patients and we see that we need an integrative biological dental medicine approach to create a treatment model for them that'll truly work. And so, like in my younger days uh, of looking for somebody to block for me, you know, I'll, uh, I'll come down and uh, hand off now and let my dear partner, Dr. Malika, take over and go over the integrated biozone therapy. And this is some new stuff that's been uh, developed lately. This, this special agent Harris, FBI, uh, don't bring the president in. We have a suspicious uh, Italian up on the front and we've got to get him you know, next one. Try this one. Okay, you'll have to follow me around now. I didn't mean to sit on it. How's that? Oh, hey, yo. E I O. Pain sucks. 
Everybody has pain, right? You know, you wake up this morning, I just, what, a couple of weeks ago, I turned 27 years old. <laughs> what are you laughing at? So I wake up in the morning, oh, God, my ass, my elbow, Jeez, I'm stretching, getting moving. Well, that's kind of like achy pain. Who's ever had a toothache, a bad toothache here? Holy crap, now that is pain. That's neurogenic pain. And that's the toughest pain because I tell you what, it is murder to deal with. You know, it's the type of pain the patient comes in. You've all seen this. You know, oh, my jaws hurt, my, you know, my TMJ is clicking, my muscles are achy. What kind of pain you have? Oh, it's kind of achy, hurts when I eat. And then you have the neurogenic pain. And they come in, ah! they're like this. My God, I'm going to kill myself. Well, let's talk about how we can approach neurogenic pain. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Klinghart because we stole a lot of his stuff. But I appreciate that. We're setting the stage. We're the warm-up for you. We're the warm-up back. So anyhow, we're calling it a new paradigm in the treatment of craniofacial pain. And the traditional model of craniofacial pain, I, you know, I managed the uh, oral facial pain clinic at a university medical center for 25 years. And when you're in a medical center setting, man, you see all kinds of crazy stuff. And the traditional model of my residency in oral facial pain at New Jersey Dental School is that, you know, we evolved back in 1984. We were concerned about cranial mandibular disorders, how the joint works, how your muscles work in, is joint clicking, all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't good enough. We had to evolve into facial pain people. But how do dentists evolve into facial pain people? Well, you know what? I want to become a neurologist. Dentist as a neurologist? Well, how do you become a neurologist? Well, you got to find the right drug, man. It's the pixie dust. You toss it on that patient until you suppress the pain to the point where they don't feel it. Well, what are you suppressing? You're suppressing the central nervous system. Do you ever look at Tegretol, Neurontin? How does that work? Nobody knows, but it just numbs the patient. And you know what? When that pain, that lancing, burny pain comes up again, what do you do about it? Give them a little bit more. Well, doctor, how long am I going to be on that drug? Don't worry about it. When your liver falls out, we'll worry about it. <laughs> Holy smokes. So let's think. I've got to think a little bit differently. And this is what drove me insane. I couldn't take it anymore with these academics that were, you know, trying to figure out the best drug to numb people to oblivion and success. They are pain-free. How are you today? Uh, wow. Okay, I'm pain free. So, foundational steps in any kind of pain management. Oh, I can look right here. This is great. Two foundational steps in neurogenic pain, nerve derived pain. They're very fundamental. Very fundamental. Step one where is the pain? We have to figure that out because that's going to really dictate your ultimate treatment. And of course, one of the big questions is, what is the pain like? Is it searing, burning? This is a very traditional thinking. But in the integrative model, which you love so much, integration puts everything on the same playing field. So that's fine. Where is the pain? What is it like? That kind of dictates where we're going to move. And one of the biggest elements is when dealing with pain, is it centrally or peripherally mediated? Mediated. And what does that mean? Well. If the pain is centrally mediated, that means it's coming what? And inside the cranium. And that's a different set of rules for didactics today. We're going to talk about peripherally mediated pain, which is outside, outside the cranial vault. Where's the pain? What is it like? Well, how do we figure that out? Well, one of the fundamental things when you're dealing with pain, you have to try to influence the pain. Because if you can change the characteristics of the pain, shut it off or influence it, that really helps dictate where the problem is. Now, Bob gave you a list of all the possible things that could possibly cause pain. And you know what? A lot of times, and most times, I would say 99% of the time, you think it's just one thing that's creating this pain? And the pain takes a life onto its own. It could be subluxation, infection, fractures, a multitude, infection, of course, we know well. So we try to influence the pain by shutting off, doing traditional what? Nerve blocks, inferior alveolar blocks, superior alveolar blocks, 
and we use one a wonderful thing called procaine. I love using procaine, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Two percent do our blocks. It's therapeutic, metabolically breaks down to great things, no, no toxicity. So one of the fundamental concepts here is where is the pain, what is it like, and can we influence it? Well, that's fine. So let's say we have peripherally running pain, could be the mandible maxilla. How can we approach this and help the patient other than numbing them into oblivion? Well, we have goals, outcomes that we really would like to see with the patient. You know, if we're thinking biologically, okay, we are biologic dentists, you know, traditional goal is what? Well, they're pain-free and functional, fantastic. They're perfectly fine. Let's think a little differently. Let's think a little deeper. Well, the first thing we want to do and our outcome, our goals, is homeostatic re-regulation and normalization of the dysregulated tissue. The tissue is not functioning right. The nerve is not acting right. It's getting bad information. It's toxic. It could be injured. It's biologically damaged. How are we going to help heal that? We want the cells to start functioning better. Well, we got to do that by detoxification, get a better blood flow. How do we do that? Via the what? Everybody familiar with the extracellular matrix? Well, get Alfred Pissinger's book because you know what? Everything is related to the matrix. Now, when we talk about ozone, we talk about treating the matrix, and this is how we work on our periodontal disease. You know, last night we're sitting at dinner, and the conversation came up with the president of the academy, Griff. He says, Phil, I was thinking, how does a cell get oxygen? How does a cell get metabolic waste away from it? I said, what are you kidding? We're at dinner. Relax. <laughs> Come on. The reality is, is that when a capillary comes along, what do you think? It rubs up against a cell? Okay, hey, here's your oxygen, you know, here's your nutrients and all that. It doesn't work that way. There's an interface called the matrix. And that matrix has to be healthy because all the toxins you know, are pulled out of those cells. All the blood supply, all the nutrients in this highly regulated autonomic area has to function properly to allow for what? The healing of the tissue. So we have to think about the matrix. This is biology. We want better circulation. What's the fundamentals of osteopathy? What rules supreme? The artery. Good blood flow in, good blood flow out. Good immunology in, good immunology out, okay? We want restoration of oxygen metabolism. Well, that's important because you know what? Have you ever had patients come in with periodontal disease? You think they're fermenting? I would say so. When you talk about fermentation, we talk about this is why it's such a great program this weekend. We talk biology. You know, ATP, man. You start fermenting and burning sugars. You're not utilizing oxygen properly. Your energetics just fall off the cliff. I love to walk around producing 36 ATP. Hey, I'm happening. When I start to ferment, ooh, I'm producing maybe two. Oh, I got chronic fatigue. Well, that's based on oxygen, okay? We want antioxidant system, the humoral antioxidant system, up and regulating. But you know what? It's a lot about ecology, right? a lot about ecology. And there's always those pathogens. I got news for you. You know what? We talk about disease. We talk about Lyme disease. I talk, you might say Lyme. I say Lyme syndrome now because there's everything known to man. From my friend, I learned that. Everything grows in you. I think we got everything. But depending on what your ecology is, that's what's going to grow. Opportunistic, pathogenic forms. Oof, they are nasty. And, of course, pain elimination and restoration of function. So it's just not, you know, we're thinking about, oh, I just want to get rid of pain, success. Let's think a little bit deeper. And think about dentists, dental physicians, okay? Maybe physician's a bad term to toss to us because we're lucky to be in this biologic world right now. We are lucky as hell, especially in the States, being dentists, all right? Biologic people, lucky. But most important to me is the concept of healing. We can help the patient heal themselves. And remember that, patients have to heal themselves. We can support that process, but only they can heal themselves. Let's think about healing. So to develop this integrative neurobiozone therapy, 
we think in terms of how we're going to get those ultimate patient outcomes. So we have to build some kind of framework in which to work. And it's really today's lecture is kind of about giving you some real pearls, but at the same time, thinking differently. I like to think about therapeutic architecture, therapeutic design that's contributing to the patient outcomes, but underpinning is the therapeutic philosophy and how you approach these patients in the healing. Now our model that we teach, we call an integrated biologic dental medicine. And this is a derivation from where we were at Capital University years ago, learning about integrated medicine. So it's a treatment philosophy that partners, and this is really critical, partners the patient and dental practitioner to develop and integrate treatment modalities that are biologically safe, effective, established, and open to emerging therapies and technologies. But we're not so serving to one set of rules or concepts with medicine or dentistry. When we think about integration, we think about everything on the playing field, all medicine and dentistry. What does that patient specifically need? But what's important to get your patients better in healing is they have to be their own advocate. I think we all know that. I'm just preaching to the choir. How, what, the, what are the worst patients you ever have? When they come in, heal me. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm going to get married here for a while. They used to drive me nuts years ago with the TMD patients. They, they want to move in. They become part of the family. They know the nurses. They know you. How's it going with the kids? This and that. Ma'am, it's been three years. I think you're better. Oh, no, please. I don't have time for that. If I fix you, get you better, you're out, you're out of here. So the integrative model, the beautiful thing about integration is that it's not a closed box. We really pop out of the box. And a bunch of you guys we train with about integration. So you really appreciate that. So everything's really on the playing field. Listen, you know what? I got news for you. Sometimes, guess what? You need an antibiotic? Yeah. I will give you the syrup and save your life. But my throat's closing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a little bit too late. Eh, take some ginkgo, you're fine. Or is it, what, silicone or whatever the hell it is? Anyhow, so... <laughs> Anyhow, so the philosophy behind we're thinking is simply thinking, you know, in a biologic manner. It's a little bit different for thinking. You're thinking biologically. One of the fundamental biologic processes going on in this pain. Pain is necessary. You know, it's a pain in the ass, but it's necessary. That if we didn't have ability to have pain and experience pain, we'd kill ourselves. I can't remember the syndrome where children are born have no pain reception. They don't last too long. They're putting pencils through their arms. I mean, we need pain. Pain is part of a healing process. Okay, it's letting the body know. It's calling, recruiting things. So what are the fundamental biology behind this? And how can we support the patient's own natural healing processes? So when we design our therapies, we really want non-suppressive therapies. We can keep them for all. Listen, sometimes you know what? You need a little drugs to get them numb, to get them past this. And so we get them on the healing road. So our, our design is really, really want non-suppressive therapies, to, you know, in this particular case, to support neurogenic homeostatic re-regulation. We want the body to start re-regulating, starting that healing process, shifting that process, and, and you know, the healing and with those basically was dysregulated neuronal tissue. So we don't want to suppress it. We want to support it. Biologic systems are open, are open energetic systems. And you have the ability to heal. That's what we want to do. We want to reach a state of homeostasis. We're constantly trying to balance ourselves. I want to be balanced, man. Well, it's a natural process. But you have to be given the tools to do that. The principles of therapeutic architecture are fundamental biology, fundamental physiology. This is where Dr. Jaffa before spoke about, you know, let's talk about physiology, biochemistry. You know what? After I got out of you know, anatomy school, went to dental school, did a residency, all kinds of stuff, I said, oh, finally, I got rid of uh, Leninger, my anatomy books, I can hang them up, I'm a clinician now. You know what? I spend more time looking at those dopey books now, because that's where the answers are. We're biologic creatures, understanding about it. Break out those old books again. Well, let's put it this way. When I broke out my Leninger book for the first time, it was a stick figure. Now it's all these three-dimensional, unbelievable things. It's like a little time warp in dental school, right, Blanche? Oh, my God. So anyhow, the architecture we look at is the principles of synergy, 
principle of anti-homotoxicology, a principle of ecobiology, and the principle of regeneration, foundational steps in building the body in a proper way. When we look at the principle of synergy, there is a fundamental biologic process called hermesis in the Berge principle. And hermesis I learned through ozone therapy in Europe, where hermesis is less is more. If you overwhelm the patient with tons of, you know, different herbs and stuff and you know, all these kinds, everything in moderation. Hormesis is less is more. Your body don't need tons of things to do. It will pick and choose what it needs. But the Berge principle folded into that is where you can take a couple of different things, a couple of multiplicity of herbs. You see the blending of the herbs today. If you join them together, a lot of times if they're working the same direction, they'll add up and enhance the process without overwhelming a body. And if you have a couple of different ones that are working in, s in separate areas, but similar function, it will really amplify the outcomes. But you don't need tons of stuff to get the biologic system going. You know, I don't need 10,000 grams of vitamin C. Believe me, you don't need it. I know you'll be sitting half the day, okay? Less is more. You tweak the system. It's a biologic, open energetic system. Tweak the system, let the system do what is necessary. Let's take an example of synergy of therapies. I love procaine. My dear friend who's gonna speak next is the king of procaine. It's amazing. I mean, it was, this was developed back in Germany years ago. And, you know, it's kind of different from dental anesthesia. You know, it has an ester bond. You know, we get it buffered, no preservatives. And we use a lot of 2%, different type of percentages of procaine. But procaine is an amazing thing to help re-regulate tissue, re-regulate nerves. If you look at some of the, the properties that it has, let's look at it carefully. It restores what's called uh, neurovegetative equilibrium by increasing or decreasing neural tonicity. So whatever the state of the nerve is, it's going to rebalance that and bring it back into homeostasis. It improves circulation in the area, which is critical for healing has a regulatory effect on cell membrane. Dysregulated cells tend to be discharged. We talked about batteries and dumping electrons. This is the ultimate electron dumper. We're recharging our batteries with procaine. Wow, holy smokes, membranes, man. Has bioelectric potential equilibrium. And one of the big things, it has high redox potential. That means it readily shifts with electrons. Your, your functionality, your life is based on what? Electron movement. We're energetic beings, man. We just happen to be in a meat suit, okay? Electrons are moving along. This does that for you. And the beauty of it is, it really breaks down to a basic of, uh, vitamin B, which is paraminobenzoic acid, and diethylaminoethanol, which is a vasodilator. We're recharging batteries, getting better circulation in the area. We're stabilizing the membrane and there's no toxicity or side effects. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, that's fine. Let's look at its pal. Ozone. Ozone, absolute scientific facts here. Well, we know ozone has great disinfection properties if used properly. It kills viruses, fungus, bacteria, parasites. It improves wound healing. It's amazing how quickly you could heal when you're not infected. It activates red blood cell metabolism, better oxygen release, really deep, 3 dpg it allows, improves that. Improves circulation via what? We talked about this, what, yesterday? Nitric oxide formation? Introduce ozone to a system, you get an increase in nitric oxide. What is that gonna do? Increase circulation. Upregulates antioxidant systems, gets the immune system up and functioning, you know, we have a uh, cellular antioxidant system upregulated, an anti-inflammatory effect, and once again, you get a high redox potential. It's dumping electrons and energy, another battery charger here. So when you talk about synergistic properties, we look at the principle of synergy. This is the perfect marriage. You know, you might hear the term prolozone. You can fix joints, back to elbows, everything, and infections in your jaw using procaine in combination with ozone. So we want to get this regulated functional tissue back up and support that healing process 
by using procaine. This is the synergy. When you start to develop your treatment plans, think about the things you're doing that are going to work in the same direction, the same direction. Well, that isn't good enough for us. We want something even better. Because once things start to activate itself, that extracellular matrix could get clogged up. It's not functioning right. So how are we going to get all the metabolic byproducts out? How are we going to get all the nutrients in? Let's take it to another level. This is where our anti-homotoxicology comes in. Developed Dr. Reckaweg a number of years ago. And these are some of the remedies that we look at, that we combine in. We want detoxification, because as you're cleaning up infection, there's residuals in there, lack of circulation, a lot of debris, want to get that circulation in, but you also want to drain. When you do surgeries, extractions, all the things we talk about here, you've got to make sure the lymphatic system is going to be able to come in, clean up, and drain the area. So we want detoxification and drainage. We want membrane function, methylization pathways, so things metabolically can move along and better blood flow. Some of the simple homeopathic remedies. Now, I do homeopathy, but, you know, I'm a dumb homeopathist, okay? Think about homeopathists. Think about that one, right, Rich? We use simple things from HEAL. Heal remedies that are injectable, things called lymphomyosot, which stimulates the immune system but allows for drainage and detoxification. Tremil, most of you have heard about. These, actually, these first three remedies are in the PDR. Tremil is a natural NSAID. I shouldn't even say NSAID. It's a natural anti-inflammatory and detoxifier that comes in an injectable form. And zeal is amazing. I love zeal because it is an anti-inflammatory but it has a lot of those nanopharmacology things. This is what we're talking about. This is nanopharmacology. It has all the elements that allow for metabolic stimulation and trace elements that help detoxification and drainage. A new lymphatic remedy that I came across is called Lymphoden from the company called Hevert. An amazing lymphatic injectable that you can do, and I'll show you in a second how it's done. But in addition to that, we have Procaine, buffered no preservatives, B12 and folic acid, which are our methylization pathway components. Now think about how cool it is to get a B12 and folic acid shot in your head. Whew, talk about my mind is open now, okay? And the little sneaky part, we put a little magnesium in there. What I liked about this weekend was all the things that docs were talking about, you see in this injectable formula that you can put in people's heads. So here's our little cocktail. Here's our little cocktail. We take procaine at 2%. We take 3 cc's up in a 10 cc syringe. We take methylcobalamin, 1 milligram per ml, or hydroxy, whatever you prefer. Folic acid, 1 cc. And then we fold our homeopathics into this cocktail. Lymphomyosite or lymphoden, one or the other. Zeal or tremeal. And you know what? You can actually put it all in because in homeopathy, the heal remedies were designed as what they call home accords. Different homeopathic remedies at different potencies, and they allow your body to choose what's appropriate for that. Because if you're taking a homeopathic that you're not going to need, you're not going to resonate with it, it's going to have no effect on you at all. Just make sure you don't take a constitutional remedy because that can erupt the whole world into itself. And then we add a little magnesium in there. If you look carefully at all this, it's synergistic and all moving in one direction. We are giving the patient in direct infusions, which I'll show you in one second, these fundamental nutrients and metabolic stimulators for detoxification, metabolic upregulation, and allowing that matrix in those cells to start to regenerate themselves. And this is a, really a localized therapy, but the picture is much bigger. A bad cannoli? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, listen, if you're Jersey, if you don't have any cannolis, you're not going to get better, believe me. So if we look at our biozone, our healing, you know, our foundational formula is a procaine, B12, folic acid, and a little touch of magnesium, and our matrix, which allows the detoxification to flow all the things we love. We've got our tremeal, zeal, lipomyocyte, and underpinning this is the ozone. If you look at this picture as a whole, we're dealing with a multitude of issues because, you know what, someone comes with all kinds of pains and problems, and this cocktail can be used for a multiplicity of things. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know what kind of bugs are going on. There's a multitude of different things. I've never found any one patient that had one problem that contributed to their pain. 
where here we're dealing on a multiple levels in a safe, effective way without any toxicity or side effect. What does ozone break down to? Water and oxygen? What do these other metabolites break down to? Simple, you know, vitamin Bs. When we do these types of injections, these are just some of the simple armamentarium. Please don't stab anybody with an 18 gauge needle. Physicians like that, dentists like, you know, 30 gauge, 27 gauge, okay? 18 gauge to draw up the stuff. And we can locally deliver this. If we're having mandibular pains or, you know, an osteonecrotic lesion of the jaw, cavitation, you know, we haven't had to do cavitation surgeries for I don't know how long using these combination of things. We can deliver this stuff through an X tip. Just infiltrate the area, soak the area in with that cocktail, and then you follow it up with ozone. Give it an opportunity, infusing the stuff into that particular area, wait for the pain to go away, and then follow up with a little bit of ozone in there, one or two cc's, and give the patient an opportunity to heal themselves. We do broader infusions because when we think about when we're dealing with pain or dealing with chronic infection, really have to take the head and neck as a whole. We have a multitude of different infusion techniques, but this broader infusion, we really take into consideration what's called the pterygoid plexus area or superior alveolar area. We infuse these cocktails up in an area, and it'll be comprehensively absorbed into the whole head and neck, and you'll get a beautiful uh, treatment out of that. So we can go from a very localized infusion directly into the wound site or broader infusions here. Well, that's fine. This is really helping the specific areas, but the picture and integration is a little bit different. Well, maybe we you know, get the patient a little bit numb, we're putting nutrients in there, we're detoxifying, draining, but we really have a deeper, a deeper approach we have to go. Let's talk about ecobiology. You know what? You're nothing but an ecosystem. And depending what your ecology is, that's what you grow. It was nice to hear about probiotics today, but you know, there's critical elements that you can fundamentally do with the biology of the, the patient the cells. Three simple things, hydration, probiotics, and enzymes. Simple, simple tool to fold in. Hydration is fundamental. Nothing will work without you being pumped up with nice water, your big water bag, and that's how everything works. Water carries information, water helps carry toxins out, helps metabolic function go in, Hydration is critical. You know, the old formula, take your body weight divided by two, that's how many ounces a day you're supposed to drink. Who knows? You know what the trick is, water? Keep sipping it all day long. Keep hydrated. Probiotics. Why are probiotics so important? Listen, let me tell you something. Talk about bugs. We are outnumbered. We are way outnumbered. We have a symbiotic relationship with all kinds of crazy things growing in us on us and all around us. And once again, what, what is dictated by that is our ecology. And probiotics is critical because it's a symbiotic relationship with your, you know, your gut. And why is our gut so important? Our gut is important because that's where your immune system lives. You can't absorb anything without a good old fermentation cake going, and you have to continually get those probiotics in. And we'll talk about that in one second. Enzymes are great. Enzymes are great for taking in between meals. They reduce down inflammation, digestive enzymes. And they're great for helping digest food. So you can absorb and assimilate the food. Because ultimately, our cures and our fixes come from our nutrition, from, from our nutrition itself. Our mantra at the school we teach is to weed, feed, and seed the gut. Weed, feed, and seed. Because you know something? If you don't poop good, you don't look good. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, man. Do you ever see somebody come in? One of our first questions when our patients come in, um, ma'am, uh, you know, are you going poop every day? Look at, wait, is this a dental office or what? <laughs> well, you know, we're outside Manhattan, so, you know, we get these different, you know, type of characters come in. Once, you know, you go to poop every day? Well, not really. Hmm. Well, how often do you go? Uh, maybe once a week. Hey, man, you know what you're full of? <laughs> it's like, holy smokes. So, you know, where does the gut begin? The gut begins right here, man, right here. And you will, obviously, you know where it ends. So when we're treating these pain patients that take it to a different biologic level, you know, we have to treat the patient broadly. You know, we have to know 
Treat it locally. Get that, you know, that whole, that whole tissue thing going. That's fantastic. But we have to get down to that gut, get that immune system up and going, okay? Getting the metabolic functions going, getting a deep gut sensation happening and pooping real good. Keep them healthy. Poop good, look good. Weed, feed, and seed that gut, okay? Well, how do we regenerate? Well, we've been, you know, treating locally with the pain. Great. We've got our nice cocktail. That's happening. Patient's feeling better. We're breaking up the pain. Our gut's starting to function better because we're getting probiotics in there. Our hydration's going. We're, you know, got our, our enzymes to help break down all those nutrients. We need our nutrients. Your food is your medicine. Your food is ultimately your medicine. This is how you ultimately heal yourself, okay? And we call it regeneration therapy because we're always regenerating ourselves. And if you can't get the nutrition through your gut, you know, you're not going to heal properly. You're always going to be on that, you know, that little edge. Some of the things I learned, you know, is really some fundamental things, nutrient-dense diet. We've seen that with the doc before talking about that. You know, the eggs, you know, you know, be careful with vegetarians, you know. Hmm. You know, you got to be a carnivore, you know, get some good meat in you, good clean food. But beyond that, you know, we talk about here, you know, membrane physiology. Where is the brain of a cell? The membrane. You know, we always thought it was the nucleus, right? Oh, it's a little brain sitting there floating around. The nucleus is really just kind of a protein factory. The brain, the intelligence, is a cell. There is the membrane itself of a cell. So how do we support membrane medicine? Well, fats are good. You know, it's so good to see your skinny coconut oil out there. I tell you what, getting those oil, that's brain food, man. You know, every day you should take a scoop of that coconut oil. I'm not promoting it, sorry. I, you know, I'm getting any good from that. But you know what? A good sco scoop of coconut oil is great. Oils and fats are critical because why? The cell membranes are made up of what? Fats. Fats. And you know... You can you get your essential fatty acids, you know, all the research is on, you know, there's different things we discussed this weekend, but, you know, four to one ratio on your you know, omega fats, it's critical. Good essential fatty acids, good oils. Every day you should take oils. Oils don't make you fat, man. Carbohydrates make you fat. Not that I would know, of course. Damn cannoli. Anyhow, so we talked about, you know, it's good to hear about, you know, phosphatidylcholine. And I just recently, you know, hooked up with a friend of mine, uh, Pat Kane, down in South Jersey. And she's really into this, you know, phospholipids, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we started really working on phosph phosphatidylcholine again. Because it's really part of the cell membrane. And we'll discuss that in a second. But another important element, which we really forget about, is, you know, we talked, you know, as mentioned before, minerals. Minerals are critical, man. That's, you know, those are the elements that make things go. But beyond that, who takes trace minerals here? Anybody? Right. Anybody, you know, listen, you know, a few hands. Trace minerals are critical. I mean, it's a great product that I like from uh, Marco Pharma has. It's called Somoplex 21. That's a great trace mineral product. We don't think about that. Somoplex. Minerals, yeah, fantastic. But those trace minerals are really critical. Those are those little sparks that make things go. So the combination of taking good oils, phosphatidylcholine, and these trace minerals really support that cellular membrane function. So now on our path to healing, well, you know, we're, giving, you know, we're getting our gut function, we're getting the nutrients in, we're taking care of our cell membranes, we're draining and detoxifying the, the extracellular matrix, our circulation is up, the immune system is functioning. Wow. We are thinking biologically. And all we have to do is allow the patient to heal themselves. And remember, they must be their strongest, strongest advocate. We talk about the phosphatidylcholine and the fats. Well, you look at this model, you see where the, the phosphatidylcholine is part of those phospholipids that make up the membrane. Okay? Taking care of membrane, thinking differently. How can that be? Well, you know, you go here, you see the neuron here. The neuron's made of what? What is the sheath around nerve endings? Fat, man. If you don't feed it, how can it heal? You know, mercury sucks. It goes along and tears up those fats. Well, without any possible nutrients that we're getting into the system to help heal, if you don't present that, the body can't heal itself. But remember, it's amazing, no matter how old you are, 
given the proper nutrients, detoxification, cleaning up your ecosystem, it's amazing how the body can heal. When I was at anatomy school, we, we dissected, I don't know, 60, 70 bodies. And, you know, I didn't know anything about clinics and, you know, clinical stuff. I was just, you know, a dumb graduate student, you know. The biggest thrill we got was name the branches of the maxillary artery, you know. But, I, you know, we used to go through these bodies and we were lab assistants. And it's amazing how much the human body can take before, you know what, it is over. They just, you just, that's it, you fold it up. What a beating. But the reality is, is that you can heal. We're always on the pathway of healing. And remember, the thing about healing, and this is really important, because we see more, more patients than anything, it's amazing. You know, the pathway to healing goes on multiple levels. Now, we've heard this a million times. You know? We heal mentally, we heal spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And that's part of it. You know? We see a lot of good chronically ill patients. We're trying to help. Get all the toxins out of their head. Do all this other stuff. But the healing process goes on multiple, multiple levels. So we're seeing here where, you know, we're given the proper nutrients, helping them detoxify, educate your patients biologically, make them their self-advocate, and they have to heal, once again, on those multiple levels. So, you know, it's difficult to, in 40 minutes or whatever I was talking, I don't even know, to put this whole picture together. It takes a little bit more thought. But we talk about anti-homotoxicology, the ecology of the body. We try to regenerate with our energy, our ozone combination, things moving synergistically along. But philosophically underneath, start thinking biologically and you'll start thinking differently. You come out of dental school, just think how dumb you are in dental school. I know everything, I can cut a great prep. Well, that's just part of it. The beauty of what we do biologically is think about it. The horizon is infinite, man. It's a beautiful thing. We're really doing healing and wellness work. It's amazing what uh, a position we're really in at this particular point. So some final thoughts is try to influence the pain. That's important because if you can't influence the pain, there's a deeper issue. Don't get tricked by, you know, we are talking before a friend of mine about some patient that had pain right here. You know, be careful not to chase the ghost of symptomology, okay? Go behind that. Think about the anatomy. Think about what's going on. Think in a deeper sense. Appreciate the patient's experience. Because how many times have you had patients come in, no one understands me. They think I'm crazy. I'm going to kill myself. I'm gonna... You're the only person that ever listened to me. Uh-oh, they're never going to leave. Okay? Appreciate their experience. Okay? Integrate your treatments. And if they're not working, try something different. Be open. Don't be locked up. Give an opportunity for things to happen, but modify and change, okay? Try to understand those biological underpinnings of the process of what's going on with this patient experience because they are biologically damaged. They're hurt some way. Something's not going on. Bad information is going on. Think about a dumb stem cell. Stem cell doesn't know what the hell to do with itself. The most important information you can, you know, energy you can give a cell is information to tell it what to do. Epithelial cells don't know what the hell to do unless you tell them what to do, okay? So if these are damaged people, the information is not going to be right and the cells aren't going to function. And once again, don't forget about the autonomics of the head and neck. The spinopalatine, otic, and submandibular ganglion, the autonomics, that salivary flow, all those things, and those can be rebooted like little computers. And when you're doing biologic therapies, you have to be patient. It's like, you know, take two aspirins and call me two weeks. No, it's a process, man, okay? It's a process. Be patient with that. And it takes time to really heal. So here's my girlfriend. That's Darla. She's a German immigrant. So we brought her from Germany. She's a mug. She's the alpha. So I wasn't going to tell this story, but I have to because, you know, we talked about bioelectrics. And I had an imperial request from the king to tell this story. You know, one of the first things we do on our first weekend when our students come in, we talk about the woo-woos. Now, everybody has woo-woos, right? Okay. The language of the woo-woo. And we have patients, you know, I have patients sitting out there with their little dousing rods and their pendulums and their things and, you know, their aluminum hats and tachyon beads. And, you know, they come in. Okay, the energy is good. Okay. <laughs> or, you know, I had one patient where I had to take a tooth out. She had to go to the horoscope. 
I had to take it out at an exact, I had a two-minute gap. And it's, sir, I'm not kidding. But you know what? I learn a lot from these patients. So, okay, that's not bad. You know, nothing surprises me much anymore. So one day a lady comes in. And I like to see the patient come in. You know, they come in, uh oh, so, uh-oh. Or they come dancing in, you know, whatever. And I look at them and say, what the hell's hanging out for a leg? I'm looking. It's a copper wire. And I'm like, that's kind of strange. And I said, okay. So she gets into the dental chair, kind of wiggles down, and her leg is hanging off on the ground. And I'm like, all right, what, what am I in for now? So I said, ma'am, um, is that a copper wire on your leg? She says, yes. I said, well, what? And she said, what, what is that for? Well, I'm grounding myself. I said, okay. I said, well, where's the other end of the wire? Oh, in my butt. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I said, and my sister there would go, wow. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go with it. So I go through the exam, you know, take her x-rays, or her 3D combi and all this crap, and she has mercury fill-ins and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I get out my, you know, my ohm meter, you know, like Dr. Tennant, and I test it. I says, oh, boy, these are, you know, showing you early. You know, they really got to be replaced. She says, well, you're doing it wrong. I says, well, now how am I doing it wrong? I says, well, I'm placing it here and pasting the one probe on the filling and one probe in the mug because it's, no, it's absolutely wrong. I says, what do you mean? Well, you know what she does? And this is, not, I'm not kidding. She grabs one of the probes and shoves it down her pants. <laughs> she said, and I'm like, what the hell is this? And she says, now test it. I'm like, I had two choices. Either, <laughs> either test it or just pick her up and throw out, but I lost my own meter. <laughs> so I said, all right, let's go with this, all right. I test it. You know something? The damn amalgam tested great. It was on, you know, that nice connection. She says, yeah, I told you so, but take them out anyhow. I appreciate that. <laughs> so be careful with those woo-woos and watch out for ohm meters and copper wires coming out of people's legs, okay? Anyhow, thanks a lot. I'll be here later for questions.